the ear, a part of our body that serves as both a sensory organ and an organ of balance. In this first part of the video series, we show how we can hear with our ears. For a better overview, scientists divide the ear into sections. The pinna is the visible part of the outer ear. Another part of the outer ear, as well as the middle ear and the inner ear, can be found in the temporal bone. The pinna is also commonly divided into different areas, only some of which are shown here. These different areas help to reflect, absorb and attenuate sound differently, allowing us to identify where a sound source is located. We will discuss this in more detail later. Now let's look at the external auditory canal, which is also part of the outer ear. There are special hairs at the entrance to the external auditory canal, which are intended to protect the inside of the ear from small animals. As we can see here, the uppermost skin layer of our external auditory canal migrates to the pinna. Glands located under the hairs produce our earwax. The sticky earwax, in which bacteria and dust become trapped, is transported out of our ear canal by the migration of the upper layer of skin. The ceruminous glands produce earwax, which is mixed with the sebum from the sebaceous glands. More information on this can also be found in the animation on the immune system. As already mentioned, certain parts of the ear are protected by the temporal bone. The temporal bone has different areas, such as the tympanic part, which protects the external auditory canal and the middle ear. The inner ear, on the other hand, is surrounded by the petrous part of the temporal bone. Due to its compact structure, the petrous part is one of the hardest bones in the human body. The petrous part of the temporal bone has numerous bone canals. This allows important nerves to reach the inner ear, for example. Canals for blood vessels and the connection between the ear and nasal cavity are also part of the petrous temporal bone. Let's now take a look inside the temporal bone to explore the inner structures. The external auditory canal has a cartilaginous portion, which is equipped with hairs and earwax-forming glands. Furthermore, the canal possesses a bony part. The eardrum forms the boundary between the external auditory canal and the middle ear in which the auditory ossicles are located. We also recognize the cochlea, which is part of the inner ear. The tympanic cavity, which belongs to the middle ear, is connected via an opening to another cavity called the antrum mastoideum. This cavity is in turn connected to other cavities, which are large in some people and small in others, or not present at all. These cavities are called mastoid cells, which are most likely intended to regulate the pressure within the tympanic cavity. Now let's take a closer look at our ossicles. Humans have three tiny ear bones, also known as auditory ossicles, which are called malleus, incus and stapes. The stapes is located at the oval window of the cochlea, which we will get to know in more detail later. The smallest bones in the human body are suspended inside the tympanic cavity with the help of ligaments. The malleus possesses three ligaments, the incus has two. There is a joint between the incus and the stapes, as well as between the malleus and the incus, which are equipped with cartilage. Ligaments hold the bones together. The malleus is connected to the tympanic membrane the tympanic membrane, or eardrum, is a thin membrane that can convert sound waves into mechanical vibrations. As soon as sound waves hit the thin membrane, it begins to vibrate. The vibration causes the malleus to rotate, and with it the incus, which pushes the stapes forward. The neck of the stapes is home to the smallest muscle in the human body. It is called the stapedius muscle. 
If the sound volume is too high and therefore the stapes moves too much, it contracts and pulls the stapes towards itself. This restricts the movement of the stapes. Another muscle that contracts when the sound level is too high is the tensor tympani. It pulls the malleus back and thus tightens the eardrum so that it can absorb less sound energy and therefore vibrates less. Both muscles restrict the movement of the auditory ossicles as soon as the sound level is too high so that the cochlea is protected from excessive pressure. Here we can see the movements of relaxed and contracted muscles at identical volumes for comparison. Let's now take a look at the areas that the stapes causes to vibrate as a result of its movements. The stapes is connected to the cochlea via the oval window. The cochlea, vestibule and semicircular canals are part of the bony labyrinth. The three semicircular canals are responsible for our sense of balance, which we will get to know in more detail in the second part. We hear with the help of the cochlea. The bony labyrinth has cavities inside that contain fluids. When the stapes moves, it transfers its energy to the fluid. This energy travels within the fluid as a pressure wave. We refer to these fluid-filled cavities as the scala vestibuli and scala tympani. They are connected at the highest point of the cochlea. A section through the cochlea clearly shows the two cavities. Another cavity, called scala media, is located between these two ducts and is also filled with a fluid. Between the scala media and scala tympani resides the basilar membrane, which enables us to hear and has important properties. Near the stapes, and therefore the oval window, it is thick and narrow. As the height increases, it becomes thinner and wider. The reason why the basilar membrane has different properties is easy to explain. Here we see two membranes, one of which is wide and the other narrow. If the same force is applied to both from above, we can clearly see the different vibration behavior. The narrow membrane moves quickly, the wide one slowly. If a force is applied to both membranes at a certain repetition rate, we can see that the vibrations of the narrow membrane are amplified and the vibrations of the wide membrane are attenuated. Since the narrow membrane is in resonance with the acting force, it moves more strongly than the wide diaphragm. The same applies to the basilar membrane. As soon as the stapes triggers a pressure wave in the scala vestibuli, the Reissner membrane is pushed in the direction of the scala media causing the basilar membrane to move. However, the basilar membrane vibrates very strongly at a certain position of the cochlea because resonance occurs. After this high deflection of the basilar membrane, the wave quickly loses its energy, which means that there are no more strong movements. With low tones, the stapes moves more slowly, which leads to resonance and thus to a high deflection at another point on the basilar membrane. This enables us to differentiate between frequencies, as different frequencies cause very specific points on the basilar membrane to move strongly. Our ear covers a range from 20,000 to 200 hertz. It is almost impossible to believe, but at 20,000 hertz, the stapes performs 20,000 movements in only one second. How strongly the basilar membrane vibrates is measured by the inner hair cells which are part of the organ of corti. We would like to illustrate this here in a very simplified way. In addition to inner hair cells, there are outer hair cells, which are arranged in three rows. The outer hair cells are connected to the tectorial membrane via tiny hairs. When the basilar membrane begins to vibrate, a fluid flow is established between the tectorial membrane and the organ of corti. The outward and inward flow causes the hairs of the inner hair cells to move with the flow and transmit corresponding signals to the brain via nerves. As the outer hair cells are attached to the tectorial membrane, they also move. If the hairs of the outer hair cells are bent to the left, the hair cells lengthen. When bent to the right, the hair cells shorten. This increases the movement of the basilar membrane and thus the flow of fluid 
which causes the hairs of the inner hair cells to move more strongly. This enables us to hear even soft sounds, as this mechanism amplifies the sound in the cochlea. Outer hair cells also enable us to better distinguish pitches, that is, frequencies. If the outer hair cells do not shorten or lengthen in response to soft noises, we can speak of impaired hearing. If the inner hair cells do not function correctly, the result is deafness. Inner and outer hair cells work according to an incredibly ingenious principle. The hairs have small bands between them, known as tip links. These bands are attached to a small opening. As soon as a tensile force is applied to these openings, they expand, allowing more K plus ions, which are present in the surrounding fluid, to flow in. K plus ions cause a reaction within the outer hair cell, causing it to contract or relax. As already mentioned, this leads to an amplification of the vibration of the basilar membrane. Here, we see the outer and inner hair cells once again. The tectorial membrane, to which the outer hair cells are attached, has been removed for better visibility. The inner hair cells move because of the fluid flow. It is also important to mention that the fluid in the cavities can hardly be compressed. For this reason, the round window, with a deformable membrane, is located at the other end of the duct system. As we have seen, the inner hair cells are connected to nerve fibers. When the small hairs of the inner hair cells bend, electrical currents are transmitted by these nerve fibers. The outer hair cells also have connections to nerve fibers, but for the sake of simplicity, we are only showing the nerve fibers of the inner hair cells. And, furthermore, only the nerve fibers that send signals to the brain. In reality, both inner and outer hair cells have nerve fibers that receive signals from the brain and send them to the brain. With the help of the cochlear nerve, the electrical signals reach the brain stem, where nerve cells are located that process these electrical signals. The processed signals travel through various stations to the thalamus, which carries out further processing and finally transmits the signals to the auditory cortex. This is where we consciously process the electrical signals. The nerve cells in our brain are able to locate a sound source. If the sound source comes from above, the reflected sound waves arrive shortly after the sound waves that reach the auditory canal directly. If the sound source is at the bottom, the reflected sound takes longer to reach the ear canal. This allows us to locate sound sources in the vertical plane. Sound sources in the horizontal plane, on the other hand, can be located using both ears. On the one hand, this is due to the difference in travel time of the sound, and on the other, due to the difference in volume between the two ears. The second part of this series deals with other structures of the ear and our sense of balance. <laughs>